not here to discuss my past. We have a lot of work to do. Once a rebel, always a rebel. Hey, welcome back Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy, and I am here to recap a lot of Star Wars history for you. I am going to talk about the entire series of Star Wars Rebels and the histories of Thrawn and Ahsoka Tano. Basically, this is everything you need to know before watching the Ahsoka TV series. And if you are only here for the Rebels recap, the chapter is marked below. We have a lot to cover, so let's get to it. Old legends, stories told to us as younglings in the temple. There's always a bit of truth in legends. Ahsoka was born in a small village on planet Shuli. Ahsoka showed force sensitivity even as an infant when she persuaded a space tiger not to eat her. Years later, she was adopted into the Jedi Order by Master Plo Koon. Soon after this, the events of the Phantom Menace happened. After evil space teamsters invade a planet with robots, Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn and his apprentice Obi-Wan Kenobi save the life of the Queen of Naboo, Padme Amidala. And then they get sidetracked to Tatooine, where they meet a kid named Anakin Skywalker who is unbelievably powerful with the Force. The cells of the highest concentration of midichlorians I have seen in a life form. Hey, Doug, I'm gonna have some lunch. Do you want some? Person, don't eat that raw packet of ramen like it's one big cookie. Yeah, I... I think I skipped an important step here, but I really hate cooking. There has to be a better way. Ah, back to what I was saying. So uh, they take Anakin back to Coruscant, the capital of the Galactic Republic, where the Naboo crisis leads to a new chancellor being elected, named Sheev Palpatine. Meanwhile, the Jedi are worried about the re-emergence of the Sith, their sworn enemies who use the dark side of the Force. Anakin immediately takes a shine to Padme. Qui-Gon's killed by a Sith Lord named Darth Maul. Obi-Wan gets his revenge and then promises to train Anakin. But more on that later on. Because now we have to go to the unknown regions of the galaxy. So this is going to get a little bit technical for a second, but this is important. Ships in Star Wars navigate through a kind of subspace called hyperspace, using super advanced computers that chart through the galaxy, kind of like Han explains here. Without precise calculations, we'd fly right through a star or bounce too close to a supernova and then it your trip real quick, wouldn't you? Now it has been theorized that hyperspace is somehow tied to the Force itself. The earliest hyperspace travelers developed the technology because they observed space whales called Pergil using the Force to travel through hyperspace. It's also thought that early Force users or Jedi were responsible for navigating hyperspace before the technology existed to allow them to do so. But the unknown regions are nearly impossible to navigate because thousands of years ago there was some kind of natural disaster that actually fractured hyperspace, creating dangerous pockets called the Chaos. People who live in the unknown regions use force-sensitive people called navigators to quickly sense their way through this chaos. So the unknown regions are totally separate from the rest of the Star Wars galaxy with different races, technology, and customs. Oh my god, person, what are you eating? Smells so good. Someone call God cause heaven's missing an angel. Well, Doug, this is chicken parmesan with broccoli and tomatoes. Very delicious. I told you not to cook food on company time. Well, this one's gonna surprise you. I did not cook this. This is a healthy, delicious, nutritious meal from Factor. They're the sponsor of this video. Factor is America's number one ready to eat meal kit. The thing is guys, it's summertime. We are all making plans. It's too hot to cook, but Factor makes it easy to eat a healthy, balanced diet. So now I can skip the grocery store with a Factor meal that is delivered straight to my door, always fresh, never frozen. The meals are ready in just two minutes and are only around 550 calories per serving. Plus, they offer more than 34 chef-prepared meal options. Everything from keto, calorie smart to vegan, and there's even a gourmet plus section. So guys, I've been using Factor for several months now and I've noticed such a big difference. There are days like when a new show episode comes out or a trailer drops and I just forget to eat or I run into the kitchen and grab a pack of ramen. But now, Factor meals help me to get through every day. It's also also so much more affordable and healthier than takeout food. So you have to give Factor a try. Head to factor75.com and use my promo code screencrush50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. Thanks again to Factor for sponsoring this video. So back to Star Wars. The major power in the unknown regions is called the Chiss Ascendancy, a very secretive, advanced, and cautious government that rules many, many planets. Now the Chiss are also a highly political culture ruled by various families on a ruling council. One Chiss named Mithral Nerodu, or Thrawn for short, is probably the greatest military mind in Star Wars. Thrawn is able to understand a culture's battle tactics by examining its art. To defeat an enemy, you must know them. Not simply their battle tactics, but their history, philosophy, art. 
And unlike most Star Wars villains, he highly values life, even saying in one novel that all life has a purpose. Now, back to the greater part of the galaxy, 10 years after Qui-Gon's death, where the Sith Lord Sidious has taken on a new apprentice, a former Jedi named Dooku, and he instructs him to lead thousands of worlds into seceding from the Republic. Anakin is now a brash, promising young Padawan who falls in love with Padme, and if he acts on that love, he would get expelled from the Jedi Order. It's not fair. War breaks out between the Separatists and an army of clones created for the Republic, which are led by Jedi Knights. Palpatine is given new emergency powers as Anakin and Padme marry in secret. After these clone wars start, Anakin is made a full-fledged Jedi and is assigned a Padawan, Ahsoka Tano. Ahsoka, like her master, is headstrong and a little annoying when she's younger. You're stuck with me, Sky Guy. But as the two of them fight together throughout the war, they mature and their powers grow. Now, during the Clone Wars, the clones start off as cookie-cutter copies of one another, but eventually they start to develop their own personalities and nicknames. Ahsoka gets very close to a commander named Rex, leader of Anakin's personal clone squad, the 501st. The Republic couldn't have asked for better soldiers, nor I a better friend. And she becomes friends with another Padawan named Barriss Offee, who, unlike Ahsoka, is a real stickler for the rules. A major attack occurs on a planet called Ryloth, where a Twi'lek freedom fighter named Cam Syndulla fights off the Separatists so the Republic can occupy their world. At a certain point during the Clone Wars, his daughter Hera salvages a droid named Chopper, and they become best friends. And help me put this panel back together. <laughs> Really? You won't be working much slower than you normally do. Now, while the Clone Wars rage on, something major happens on Mandalore. The Mandalorians are a very warlike people, and their wars turn their planet into a wasteland. They built super powerful, invincible armor made out of Beskar that was passed down in their families for hundreds of years. Armor that can withstand a lightsaber. But now, for several years, they have been pacifists and they have chosen to remain neutral in the Clone Wars. But the Republic suspects that Duchess Satine is working with the Separatists, so they send Obi-Wan Kenobi to investigate. Who fell in love with Sabine when they were teenagers? And he even tells her, Had you said the word, I would have left the Jedi Order. But out in the galaxy, Darth Maul has survived his haven, and he is plotting revenge against Obi-Wan Kenobi and his former master, Darth Sidious. Now, Maul is from planet Dathomir, which is inhabited by powerful dark side users called the Night Sisters. He makes an alliance with Death Watch, a Mandalorian warmongering terrorist group who oppose Satine. Maul, his brother Savage Press, and Death Watch unite various crime syndicates into a force that retakes Mandalore. And then he murders Satine right in front of Obi-Wan. Maul then wins the Darksaber in a duel, making him the leader of Death Watch and all of Mandalore. Wait, what's the Darksaber? Right, the Darksaber is an important Jedi slash Mandalorian artifact, and some Mandalorians believe that whoever wins that Darksaber in combat is the rightful ruler of the planet. Well, that's stupid. <laughs> that's the rule. Members of Death Watch then split off into different sects, including one called the Children of the Watch. These are religious hardliners who rescue a young boy named Din Djarin from Separatist droids. Ahsoka also trained a young partisan named Saw Gerrera, who watched his sister die in battle, and he swears vengeance on the Separatists for causing her death. So, during the war, Anakin, Ahsoka, and Obi-Wan travel to a strange Force world called Mortis, inhabited by beings called the Sister, the Brother, and the Father, who represent the good side of the Force, the dark side, and the balance between the two. This is also when Ahsoka starts to dual wield her lightsabers, which makes her even more awesome. Very, very long story short, Ahsoka is killed, but then the sister gives her life essence to keep Ahsoka alive. After this, Ahsoka has a mystical connection with an owl named Morai, and she sort of becomes the embodiment of this sister figure and the good side of the Force. Padme then disappears on a mission in the Unknown Regions, and Anakin heads off to rescue her, and that is when Anakin crossed paths with Thrawn for a team-up. Now, Thrawn was on a mission to find potential allies to the Chiss, and he is intrigued by this other part of the galaxy, and by this war that's raging across thousands of star systems. Long story short, Anakin saves Padme and returns home just as somebody bombs the Jedi Temple, killing many, many people, and Ahsoka is framed for the crime. She is kicked out of the Jedi Order, but then she does some digging and discovers that her old friend Barriss Offee committed the crime because... And my attack on the Temple was an attack on what the Jedi have become, an army fighting for the dark side, fallen from the that we once held so dear. The Jedi Council invites Ahsoka back into the Order, but she is disillusioned by their prior decisions, and she leaves the Jedi, which makes her master, Anakin, resent the Jedi Council for driving her away. Soon, Ahsoka is recruited by Bo-Katan Kryze, a former member of Death Watch and the sister of Duchess Satine. Bo-Katan asks for Ahsoka and the Republic to help her retake Mandalore from Darth Maul and his sect of evil Mandalorians. 
So Ahsoka leads a special detachment of the 501st alongside her old buddy Rex to help Bo-Katan retake Mandalore. Bo-Katan's right hand is a woman named Ursa Wren, a warrior from a high Mandalorian house called, you guessed it, House Wren. Ahsoka helps retake Mandalore, even beating Darth Maul in a straight up duel. Meanwhile, Chancellor Palpatine has been kidnapped by Count Dooku, but he is rescued by Anakin Skywalker. Good, Anakin, good. Kill him, kill him now. Do it. Afterwards, Palpatine pressures the Jedi Council to admit Anakin as his personal representative, but... You are on this council, but we do not grant you the rank of master. What? And this makes Anakin resent the council even more, especially when they ask him to spy on his mentor, his father figure, Palpatine. Now on top of that, he discovers that his wife, Padme, is pregnant and he keeps dreaming of her dying in childbirth. Palpatine tells Anakin that the dark side of the force could keep his wife from dying and eventually he puts it all together. You're the Sith Lord. So when the Jedi try to arrest Palpatine, Anakin saves his life and then he turns to the dark side and gets a new name. Darth Vader. Palpatine then activates a control chip inside the clones' heads that make them turn on the Jedi as thousands of Jedi are killed throughout the galaxy, and Darth Vader leads an attack on the Jedi Temple that kills every Jedi, even the younglings. Except one of these younglings was an extremely powerful Force user named Grogu, who was rescued from the Temple but later fell into the hands of certain underworld figures. Across the galaxy, a Jedi Master named Deepa Balaba sacrifices her life to save her Padawan, a boy named Caleb Doom. Meanwhile, Ahsoka survived Order 66 and even uses the Force to find and eliminate Rex's control chip. The two of them survive, even freeing Darth Maul, and they barely escape with their lives. Palpatine then frames the Jedi for starting the war and reorganizes the Republic into... Darth Vader travels to a lava planet called Mustafar to finish off the Separatists, and he is pursued by Padme and Obi-Wan, who also survived the Jedi Purge. He force chokes Padme out of rage, and he thinks he killed her, and then he and Obi-Wan have an epic duel. <laughs> Meanwhile, the great Jedi Master Yoda duels Palpatine, he loses, and then retreats into hiding. Obi-Wan defeats Anakin, cutting off his limbs and leaving him. Very badly burned. Padme actually survived the Force choke long enough to give birth to twins, who she names Luke and Leia. The twins are kept secret and put into hiding. Obi-Wan gives Luke to Anakin's stepfamily on Tatooine, while a wealthy senator named Bail Organa offers to raise Leia. One of these kids got a much better deal than the others. Anything good today? A trade ship and an Aquilian Ranger. Probably scouring for pirates. That's what I said. Meanwhile, Vader is placed in a new cybernetic suit and is fully a Sith Lord and spends decades tracking down and murdering all the remaining Jedi. He is aided by other dark side users called Sith Inquisitors. They aren't powerful enough to be full-fledged Sith Lords, but they are very good at hunting down and killing Jedi Knights. Ahsoka, meanwhile, tries to live her life unnoticed, but soon she is tracked down by an Inquisitor who she defeats in a duel. Afterwards, Bail Organa recruits her into a rebellion against the Empire. Over the years, various rebel cells and factions appear throughout the galaxy. Some, like the one led by Saul Gerrera, are violent extremists. The partisan Alliance, sectorists, human cultists, galaxy partitionists, they're lost. All of them, lost. And Ahsoka, using the code name Fulcrum, helps to coordinate these cells with the help of spies like Luth and Rael. So let's shift back to the unknown regions and talk about Thrawn. I will be here to listen. So Thrawn, as a tactician, is always more interested in results than he is in rules. Long story short, he violates Chiss' rules of non-interference when he confronts an enemy called the Grisk. The Grisk are a major threat to the Chiss in the unknown regions, and we might even see them in the Ahsoka series. And then the politicians strip him of his status and rank. Thrawn knows that the Chiss need allies in the other part of the galaxy, so he leaves the unknown regions to join the Empire. Now, because he doesn't speak the language of the Imperials, he is assigned an interpreter named Eli Vanto to become his personal aide. The two of them attend the Imperial Academy together as Thrawn swiftly ascends the ranks. Now, as Thrawn rises through the ranks of the Empire, his tactical brilliance is resented by his fellow commanders who hate that Thrawn never seems to need their help. When he is elevated to the rank of Grand Admiral, he actually sends Eli Vanto into the Unknown Regions to join the Chiss Ascendancy as their first human officer. Meanwhile, the clone troopers are gradually phased out in favor of human troopers as the Empire begins to crack down on every planet. On planet Ryloth, the Imperial seize control and try to imprison the freedom fighter Camp Syndulla, so he flees the planet with his wife and young daughter Hera. On Mandalore, the Empire forced Bo-Katan from power and recruited Mandalorians into the Imperial Academies. Ursa Wren's daughter, Sabine Wren, is a brilliant scientist. You know, 
I'm something of a scientist myself. Who invents a weapon that actually destroys Mandalorian Beskar armor. Fearing that it would be used against her people, she drops out of the Academy to become a bounty hunter and eventually a rebel, much to the dishonor of her family who have sworn loyalty to the Empire. The Empire also massacred a race of people called the Lassat, nearly causing them to go extinct. The attack was commanded by Lieutenant Callus, who carried out this order reluctantly, but more on him in a bit. All of this leads to the creation of the rebel cells named the Spectres, later known as Phoenix Squadron. They consist of Zet, a Lassat who is one of the last of his kind, and then there's Sabine Wren, daughter of Ursa Wren, and that little Padawan I talked about who was saved by the Bad Batch grew up and became Kanan Jarrus. Kanan is in a romantic relationship with the leader of the Spectres, a grown-up Hera Syndulla, who is also one of the best star pilots in the galaxy. Oh yeah, and Chopper, and their ship is called the Ghost. Hera takes her orders directly from an agent called Fulcrum, aka Ahsoka Tano. So the Spectres are based on planet Lethal, and as they're carrying off hit-and-run attacks on the planet, they encounter a street rat named Ezra Bridger. Kanan soon realizes that Ezra is Force-sensitive, and even though he left the Jedi life behind him, he agrees to train Ezra in the ways of the Force. But two new Jedi working together attracts the attention of the Sith Grand Inquisitor, the leader of the Emperor's Dark Side-wielding task force who is tasked with hunting down Jedi Knights after the Purge. At first, Kanan struggles to teach Ezra because he himself never completed his training. Then, he and Ezra visit a hidden Jedi temple on Lethal, one of the very few in the galaxy that the Empire never destroyed. Kanan gets some advice from Master Yoda, who is still living in exile, while Ezra finds a kyber crystal for his very own lightsaber slash blaster hybrid. This is when we also learn about Ezra's special ability to use the Force to talk to and control animals, which is going to be very important later on. Then, Kanan is captured by the Grand Inquisitor and is taken to Mustafar, where he'll be tortured in the palace of Darth Vader. There is evil there that does not sleep. But the Spectres carry off a daring rescue with help from other rebel cells. And all these cells are uniting together for the first time. The Grand Inquisitor is killed, but the success of these two Jedi attract the attention of Darth Vader. And this is where Ahsoka joins the crew. Vader fights Ezra and Kanan and nearly kills them both. Kanan? What was that? And then, later on during space combat, Ahsoka connects with Vader's mind and they learn the truth about each other. The apprentice lives. Ooh, it's so good. And the team encounters even more Inquisitors as they're driven off the thaw and they realize that they need to find a new base. Ahsoka leads them to our old pal Rex and a couple other clones who remove their control chips because these clones know potential bases from the Clone Wars that the Empire can't find. Now Kanan, understandably, doesn't like clones. The clones, the ones we Jedi fought side by side with, suddenly turned and betrayed us. I watched them kill my master. But they overcome their differences, fight off the Empire, and Rex joins the Rebellion, reuniting with Ahsoka. The ghost crew encounter the hyperspace-traveling space whales called Purgil. Ezra makes a connection to them with the Force and understands that they're just trying to migrate and raise their whale families. Hera also returns to Ryloth to reconcile with her father, and like all of us, when she goes home, that accent slips out a little bit. I am not wasting my life. I help people. I lead ships into battle. I am part of something bigger. She inherits her family's Kalakori, a piece of art that details her family's history. Now, the rebels help Zeb's people, the Lassat, find a new homeworld after Kallus and the Empire devastated their planet. But soon after that, Zeb and Kallus are stranded together on a planet where Kallus tells him the truth, that he did not know the Empire was going to destroy Zeb's home planet, and he has been haunted by that day for years. It wasn't supposed to be a massacre. But I realized the Empire wanted to make an example. Zeb ends up letting Callus go and the two warriors part with a kind of mutual understanding. Meanwhile, Kanan and Ezra narrowly escape two Inquisitors, so they decide, along with Ahsoka, to return to the Jedi Temple on Lethal to try to reconnect with the spirit of Yoda or some other Jedi Master. Kanan's visions see him confronting his self-doubt, and he has finally made a full Jedi Knight. Ahsoka's suspicions about Anakin are confirmed. Do you know what I have become? And then Yoda tells Ezra that the key to defeating the Sith is in a world called Malachor. Malachor? Well, who's Malachor? God, what an idiot. Chopper helps the rebels to find a new hidden base off all Imperial maps, and they call it... Chopper Base. 
and then some major stuff happens. The Jedi go to Malachor, which is the site of an old Sith temple. They get separated, and Ezra runs into an older Darth Maul, and he earns Ezra's trust. The Inquisitors show up, everybody duels, and then Maul reveals the temple itself is a giant Sith weapon, but he needed the help of an apprentice, Ezra, to help him open it. Maul fights Kanan and blinds him. Maul and Ezra activate the weapon with the Sith holocron as Kanan has to learn to fight blind to defeat Maul. <laughs> Meanwhile, Ahsoka races to the top of the temple to stop Ezra, and guess who flies in on a TIE fighter? Your mom? Darth frickin' Goodwin. Darth frickin' Vader. I don't fear you. Then you will die braver than most. Ezra is outgunned, but Ahsoka shows up and square goes against her former master. Ezra is all tempted to use the Sith super weapon to defeat the Sith, but Kanan talks him out of it, and Ezra grabs the Sith holocron. Meanwhile, Ahsoka damages Vader's mask, leading to this heartbreaking moment. Ahsoka. Anakin. As the temple crumbles around them, Ezra is helpless to save Ahsoka's life. And now it's one year later and Ezra is a growing teenage boy. He's way more powerful and has a green lightsaber now, and sometimes he's getting a little too close to the dark side. Ezra and Sabine develop a close connection, a really strong friendship that might even be romantic. Kanan meets an ancient force being called the Bendu who teaches him how to use the force to fight blind. But meanwhile, the Spectres have become Phoenix Squadron and their greatest foe comes to Lothal, Grand Admiral Thrawn. And pull the rebels apart piece by piece. They'll be the architects of their own destruction. Now at this point, Thrawn has become the most brilliant tactician in the Empire, even recently teaming up with Darth Vader to stop an evil race called the Gris from threatening the Chiss Ascendancy. So Thrawn defeats the Rebels again and again and again, and each time they narrowly escape as he gets closer to finding their base. He even pursues them to Ryloth, where he studies Hera's family's art to understand and defeat her. Thrawn learns that there is a spy called Fulcrum hiding in Imperial Command and vows to root them out. I'm the spy. Nope, it's not Hux. It's our old friend, Agent Callus. Wait, wait, Callus is Fulcrum? How does that even make sense? Maul then later forces Ezra to go to his home planet of Dathomir. So when Maul and Ezra complete their vision, they realize that they both need to seek out Obi-Wan Kenobi on Tatooine. Kenobi! Now, Obi-Wan has spent the past 18 years watching over Anakin's son, Luke, as he was raised by his step-uncle and aunt, Owen and Beru. Hello there. There was a brief period of time, though, where Obi-Wan left for about a week to rescue Leia from some people. Then he had a rematch with Anakin, discovered he was Darth Vader, and the whole thing was, like, very heartbreaking. And for some reason, he let Darth Vader live again. Good job. Anyways, Ezra finds Obi-Wan, and the Jedi Master basically tells him to walk on his own path. And then, Maul and Obi-Wan have their final duel. <laughs> Afterwards, Kenobi assures Maul that the boy he's watching over, Luke, will grow up to destroy the Sith. He will avenge us. The Rebels need access to a key area of space which is controlled by a sect of Mandalorians called the Protectors. Their leader is named Finn Rao, a former guard to Duchess Satine. Rao has been forced to swear loyalty to the Empire. You see, Mandalore is now ruled by a Mandalorian Imperial Viceroy named Gar Saxon who actually served under Darth Maul in the Clone Wars right here. So, when Sabine was on Dathomir looking for Ezra, she found the Darksaber that I talked about earlier. This is an important symbol of Mandalorian leadership. Sabine now wants to use the Darksaber to confront Gar Saxon, so Kanan trains her how to use it. And after Finn Rao provides her with some Mandalorian tactics, she is ready to return home. To save everyone! My mother! My father! My brother! Everything I did was for family! Then Sabine duels Gar Saxon, beats him, but then he turns on her and she almost dies until her mom kills the Imperial Viceroy. And just like that, Clan Wren and a bunch of other Mandalorians are rebelling against the Empire. Sabine decides to stay with her people and doesn't rejoin the Rebel Squadron just yet. Now, around this time, Mon Mothma goes too far when she criticizes the Emperor and they force her to leave the Senate. A warrant is put out for her arrest. So Phoenix Squadron brings her to the Rebel base where she makes a formal declaration for the Rebel Alliance, calling for all the factions to join together. This is our rebellion. Thrawn works out that Kallus is the spy, and he arrests him. This sets a trap for the other rebels. It's a trap! They're almost defeated, but then Sabine and the Mandalorians show up. Kallus escapes with the rebels, gets a dreamy new haircut. Your haircut? Notice you've copied my beard. The rebels join Sabine to help overthrow the Empire's presence on Mandalore. They're also joined by Bo-Katan Kryze as other factions come to their side against Gar Saxon. But the Empire has rebuilt Sabine's machine that destroys Mandalorian armor. But Sabine's able to reverse the machine so it'll work against Stormtrooper armor. Sabine then gives the Darksaber to Bo-Katan, who is now the new leader of a free Mandalore. Where they all lived happily ever after. 
Afterwards, Sabine goes back to join the team at their new base on Yavin 4 as they find evidence that the Empire is building a super weapon with giant kyber crystals. Then, Phoenix Squadron decides that they have to leave the Rebel Alliance and return to Lothal so they can stop Thrawn's TIE Defender factory from being built. But the larger Rebel Alliance cannot commit the amount of resources it takes to retake the entire planet. So, on Lothal, Ezra meets a large white loath wolf that talks to him, saying, <laughs> And on the planet, they're pursued by Thrawn's top assassin, a Nogri Death Commando named Rook. Rook and the Imperials have them cornered until the Loath Wolves lead them into a tunnel that mystically brings them to the other side of the planet. So there's some weird Force stuff happening on Lothal, which is why the Jedi built their temple there thousands of years ago. Now Hera tries to lead an attack force against the Imperial base, but Thrawn decimates her forces, again, using her family's artwork to understand her tactics. To me, they are not merely trophies, but symbols that truly represents some of my greatest adversaries. Afterwards, Hera is captured, and then the wolf talks to Kanan. I understand. What must I do? And Kanan sees a vision of his future. He leads a mission to rescue Hera. They get romantic. I love you. And then he sacrifices his life to save the crew. This also destroys the refinery on Lothal and shuts down the TIE Defender factory. So the wolf, who may or may not be Kane in spirit, it's kind of hard to tell. The wolf tells Ezra to go back to that Jedi temple, where the Empire is excavating it, while a Sith historian has uncovered a mural of the brother, the sister, and the father. And that means something. Ezra, it's art. Everything has a meaning. Ezra uses the Force to move their hands into a certain position. And then a bunch of wolf drawings run in a circle, and Ezra enters the world between worlds. What's the world between worlds? The world between worlds is a nexus between all of space and time. Inside of it, Ezra hears voices from the past, present, and future. And then Ahsoka's spirit owl, Morai, leads him to a portal where he sees Ahsoka's final moments in the duel against Vader, and then he saves her life. Time travel! The two of them keep Palpatine from entering this realm, and then Ahsoka stays behind to learn more about the Force and stuff like that. And then the Rebels launch their final plan to retake Lothal. There's a big battle, the Purge will show up, and then Ezra uses the Force to communicate with the Space Whales to teleport him and Thrawn far, far away, presumably into the Unknown Regions. Afterwards, Hera becomes a High Commander in the Rebel Alliance, and she has Kanan's baby. Now, shortly after this, the Empire unveils the super weapon that it worked so hard to create, the Death Star, a planet-killing weapon. A group of Rebel spies leads a daring mission to steal its plants, and for the first time, the Rebel Alliance launches a major attack against the Empire. The Empire. The Rebels recover the plans with Darth Vader hot on their heels and barely get them into the hands of Vader's secret daughter, Leia. Then a new hope happens, Luke meets his friends, destroys the Death Star, you know all that stuff, let's fast forward. <laughs> However, during this time, the Empire cracks down on Mandalore. Bo-Katan surrenders the Darksaber to Imperial Moff Gideon, but Gideon chooses to devastate the planet, scattering sects of Mandalorians across the galaxy. The war against the Empire goes on, Empire strikes back, Return of the Jedi, and the Rebel Alliance is victorious across the galaxy. Afterwards, Sabine and Ahsoka embark on a mission to find Ezra and Thrawn, off to the unknown regions of the galaxy. But the Empire initiates the Emperor's Contingency Plan, called Operation Sender. This will destroy Imperial World's resources, and then the best of the best Imperials will travel to the Unknown Regions to build a better Empire. The, first order. the remaining Imperial forces are soundly defeated at the Battle of Jakku. Back to Why does everyone want to go back to Jakku? And afterwards, the Chancellor of the newly restored Republic, Mon Mothma, signs a peace treaty with the Empire that allows planets to stay under Imperial rule if they choose to. The negotiations were short but it says they cannot have militaries. She then orders 90% of the Republic's military forces to be dismantled. That was not smart. That was not smart. Meanwhile, Imperial warlords and garrisons still roam the Outer Rim, vying for power against each other. Din Djarin has grown up to be a feared bounty hunter who takes a mission to capture Grogu. He learns that Grogu is Force-sensitive and becomes attached to the little guy, eventually freeing him from Imperials. The two of them go on the run, as Din vows to deliver him to his own people, the Jedi. But instead, he finds Ahsoka. Ahsoka Tano! Bo-Katan sent me. We need to talk. I hope it's about him. Ahsoka is hunting down a woman named Morgan Elsbeth, who I'm telling you may be one of those dark side wielding night sisters we talked about earlier. With a little bit of help from Din Djarin, she defeats Elsbeth in combat and asks her, Where is your master? Where is Grand Admiral Thrawn? 
Afterwards, Grogu is taken by Moff Gideon's forces because they're trying to use Grogu's blood to create Force-sensitive clones. Then gets some help from a resurrected bounty hunter named Boba Fett and his loyal second, Fennec Shand, and then all of them team up with Bo-Katan to take down Moff Gideon and save Grogu. Then Luke Skywalker shows up, saves their lives, and recruits Grogu as the first student of his new Jedi Academy. So Din rejoins his people, but he misses Grogu, and he visits Ahsoka at the New Jedi Temple. After training with Luke for a while, Grogu gets new powers, but he wants to be with the Mandalorian, and the two of them reunite to help Boba Fett take the place of Jabba the Hutt as the leader of the crime syndicate on Tatooine. Now, various Imperial moles have actually infiltrated the New Republic, being guided by an Imperial Shadow Council. This Shadow Council is hoping to clone Emperor Palpatine, but mostly, they're waiting for the return of their leader, Grand Admiral Thrawn. So the Mandalorians retake their world from Moff Gideon, Bo-Katan is made leader of their people, and Den and Grogu settle down to freelance for the New Republic, maybe alongside her old pal Zeb. I think that pretty much sums it up. Well guys, that's the entire history of Thrawn, Ahsoka, and Star Wars Rebels. Everything you need to know before you watch the Ahsoka TV show. And just a reminder everyone to take the hassle out of eating healthy, give Factor a try. Head to factor75.com and use my promo code SCREENCRUSH50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. But we want to hear from you guys. What do you think of this? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.